Hello everyone, welcome back. If you haven't seen the first part of the video on the period between 1914 to 1945, please go back and watch it because in that video I talk about all of the social and political changes which were which happened in this period. And in this second video, we are going to talk about the literary changes and developments that happened in uh, between uh, the two world wars. So let's just quickly dive in and start our analysis of modernism. Whenever we talk about modernism, we have two very different definitions. A general definition which, uh, in which we apply the term modernism to any kind of literary production in the interwar period bef uh, between the First and the Second World War that deals with the modern world. So this is just a general definition of modernism. However, the term modernism is also more narrowly defined as a kind of work that represents the transformation of traditional society under the pressures of modernity, all of the social and political changes that were happening. And this kind of this work usually breaks down traditional literary forms in you know discussing uh, all of these transformations which the society is experiencing. Um, there is also another term that you have to be familiar with and you have to know about, and it's this one right here, high modernism. And high modernism is usually applied to the works written by um, kind of like symbolic writers of this movement, the most important writers of the movement who were intellectuals and they were writing not for, you know, the common people and they were writing for an elite group of reader, readers who had an encyclopedic knowledge uh, of everything like world history, uh, world mythologies and religions, somebody who was equipped with all of that information and could eventually connect all of the dots and fragments in the works in order to come up with the with uh, you know the meaning of the work. So that's high modernism. But it's fascinating that you know those works that we usually associate with high modernism were somehow anti-modern because they don't look at modernity and you know as something positive they they actually describe modernity as an experience of loss and that's why even though they are called high modernist works they are anti-modern in nature and so just uh, let's take a look at for example T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland it is a great poem it is one of the central and classic works of modernism but just it represents the modern world as a scene of ruin and destruction. So the fact that we call a work uh, like high modernist does not necessarily mean that you know the writer uh, loved modernity or was in favor of modernity. So I just wanted to make that point clear for you. So scholars who work in the field of modernism usually trace the roots of modernism to late 19th century to French uh, symbolism and symbolists to the works of Friedrich Nietzsche in philosophy and of course the ideas of Charles Darwin in the idea of like uh, evolution in the theory of evolution so these are the roots of modernism of course you know Modernism was not something specific to literature. You, we, we can find modernist uh, works in the realm of sculpture, painting, dance, as well as, of course, um, literature. So if we want to just talk about literature from poetry, we can, you know, uh, talk about the poetry of William Butler Yeats. When it comes to novels, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the whole, you know, international movement of modernism, not just in America. So if you think about, for example, novels, the first word that usually comes to mind is Ulysses or Ulysses by James Joyce. We have Marcel Proust in France, Remembrance of Things Past. We have Thomas Mann's short stories and novels, uh, prominent among which is, of course, The Magic Mountain. All of these are like perfect examples of modernism in England or, of course, you know, continentally speaking. It's important to keep in mind that you know, most of these people and the intellectuals of the period believe that our structures, 
of the structures of human life which we previously believed in have either been destroyed or they are they have uh, been proven to be falsehoods or just you know they're simply like kind of uh, a human construct which cannot be trusted so this is where modernism comes into play as this kind of you know having doubts about some of those assumptions and beliefs that we used to believe were defining us could help us you know conduct a better life and so all of these ideals which were important to people were shown to be falsehoods uh, not something for example 100 percent true so uh, ideals like for example order sequence and unity in the work they were saying that yeah this is something that human beings want but they're not this is not a, a, a for example, a, a manifestation. These things are not uh, present in our real world. And so we cannot use generalization, we cannot use abstractions, we cannot use high flown writing to reveal the truth because there is no unified truth. And they, in fact, when you're trying to portray the truth using generalizations, abstractions, and all of this, you are rather concealing the truth, okay? And so, uh, going back to what I discussed in the first video, because, you know, they were saying that, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity uh, proved that, you know, everything is relative depending on the time and place that you are experiencing it. Um, Freud's idea of, you know, the fragmented structure of our brain, all of this created this kind of feeling in the intellectuals of the period that maybe truth is not something unified, that what we consider to be real is not something unified in, for example, whole, does not have an order, for example, and so everything is fragmented. And so what they did was that, you know, they said that if you want to really portray the, the condition of man in our modern world, you have to portray fragmentations of his experience in this world. And so most modernist literature, one of the key features of modernism, of course, high modernism to be precise, is, you know, construction out of fragments. In other words, when a modernist artist is trying to create a work of art in sculpture, in literature, wherever, they will try to write something. Let's talk about just writers. Um, and then you can like generalize it to other <clears throat> arts as well. So writer, writers, when they want to write something, they don't write a unified experience for you in which like everything is connected smoothly. What they show you as an artist is fragments, different segments. And these segments are not connected. So it's your duty as a, as a reader of literature, for instance. It's your responsibility to connect them, to find the meaning. And I will tell you why this is happening in the modern period. So what they do is that they put some fragments in their works, which are you know, seemingly not connected at all. And that's why reading a modernist work is actually a challenging task because uh, you have to find correlations and connections between these seemingly irrelevant parts in order to find the meaning of the work. And so, modernist literature is usually famous for a lot of deletions and omissions. It deletes, for example, all of those explanations that connect the parts. It's, it, it usually omits a lot of interpretations that can help you interpret the work. They also delete all of the connections between the different parts. And so anything in the work that can give the work continuity, perspective, interpretation, anything that can give a work, as I said, continuity, perspective, and interpretation is completely deleted in the work, okay? And, and one example of this is kind of plot which became very, very popular in this age, and that's elliptical plot. The writers of fiction in this period did not see the, uh, did not find it necessary to, you know, provide, um, I don't know, expositions for you. 
introducing all of the characters, like where they come from, what's their story, and who are they. They usually don't include uh, the exposition, which was very common. I'm not saying all of them, but most of them do not really provide you with a kind of exposition that at the beginning of the story introduces everyone and tells you like who they are, what they believe in, the characters. And so elliptical plot is one of the uh, dominant features of fiction in this period where a lot of background information about the characters is completely like deleted because it's not necessary or they believe that you as the reader have to like fill in the gap and find all of those connections, okay? So uh, one, uh, uh, there are a lot of examples that come to mind. Like for example, if you read the stories of James Joyce uh, in his Dubliners, there's a story called Clay. I'm just gonna give, I don't wanna spoil it for you, but it's just about a girl who has, you know, all her life, he, she has tried to find love, right? And, you know, everybody keeps like making fun of her that, hey, have you found the love yet or not? And so uh, all of her friends are kind of, I'm giving you a very, you know, a very vague summary of it because I honestly don't want to spoil it for you in case you decide to read it, which you should. So it's the story of this girl who has tried all her life to find love. And so they start like making fun of her. And so one night, which is like in the holiday season, her friends like uh, invite her over and they tell her to sing something. You know, the writer does not really give you all of the, this information that she has always craved love. She has always looked for her soulmate or somebody to love. And, uh, but because it's not necessary, like for Joyce, it's not necessary to provide us with all of this information. He can do this by giving us a slice of life. So literature... Modernist fiction is usually described as being a slice of life. It's just a, a slice of life given to you and you have to interpret it for yourself. And so uh, they, they ask this girl to sing a song because, well, it's a holiday. And so when she sings a song, she adds a new line to, to the song which does not exist in the original song. So she adds a new line, and I don't remember the exact line, but it goes something like this, that oh, how, feel, how good I feel when I remembered the time when you said that you loved me. This very small line, which she adds to the original song, and it didn't exist in the original song, reveals a lot about the, 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 what kind of character she is, right? So instead of giving you like a few pages of exposition of like what kind of person she is, what kind of experiences she's had in her life, Joyce just does all of this with a simple line that she mistakenly or unconsciously adds to a song. This is an example of an elliptical plot. So when you are reading modernist fiction, what is given to you on the page is important, but always look for things which have been omitted, which have been deleted, because those are also really, really important, okay? So that's why, as I said, that's why reading modernist fiction is usually very challenging for students and for people, <clears throat> for readers of literature in general, because, you know, they usually begin very, like, randomly. So you are, you are wondering, hey, where am I in this story? Am I like a... In the beginning of the story, am I in the middle of the story, even at the end of the story? And then the story just moves on without really any kind of explanation because all of that has been deleted by the writer. It's not necessary. And then it can even end without any kind of resolution. So you are left wondering, hey, what happened finally? I don't see any resolution. I don't see any denium at the end of the, for example, novel. Okay, so these are just like different kinds of segments which are juxtaposed without really integrating them, without including any kind of transitions to make sense of what is going on. So your role as a reader of literature is even more important here. And uh, the reason for this is also very interesting again. Most of these writers believe that, you know, finding meaning in life is difficult, right? A lot of people struggle with finding the meaning in their lives and and so they say that when the experience of finding meaning in life is difficult, 
The experience of reading should also be difficult and challenging. We shouldn't give the meaning to the to the readers easily so that they can easily say, oh yeah, this is what the work is about. So you have to be present. You have to focus all of your attention in the work, okay? Because uh, realists want you to be present. So uh, let me jump just a few lines because they believe that the writer is actually an integral part of the meaning-making process. You are very important as a reader because you take part in the process of you know, in meaning-making, in the meaning-making process. You have to be present in this process to find the meaning of the work, okay? So, as we said, um, usually modernist works are fragments, you know, which are not connected, etc. However, there are some high modernist writers who... Uh, put all of this discontinuous or disconnected elements into a big picture. So even though the, there are segments, <coughs> I apologize, even though there are segments uh, which are disconnected, but still these segments are brought uh, to the audiences, are presented to the audiences as being parts of a larger picture or a larger pattern, right? And this is the result of world literature, world mythologies, and world religion. So, they put these fragments within the context of a big picture so that the big picture can somehow help you get the meaning. So, for example, James Joyce's Ulysses is about, you know, a modern kind of analysis of the characters of Homer's Odyssey. Or, for example, Iliad's Wasteland is, again, the story of uh, you know, life and death and resurrection, but uh, portrayed from a modern perspective. So it's a Christian kind of uh, story, but in a modern landscape. Or Joyce's Ulysses is actually a mythological story, but in a modern landscape. So they usually sometimes uh, use world literature, mythologies from different cultures or religions in order to provide like a canvas. Imagine that you're a painter, you need a canvas on which, you know, you paint your painting. So this is what these high modernists do. Now, I'm gonna like tell you a trick that you can use to understand works of modernism. If you remember, like at the beginning of the uh, first lecture, I told you that like there were some debates among the scholars in modernism about the, the use of literary tradition. Should we use uh, traditional forms of literature or should we completely forget about them? When you are reading a work of literature which you know is a modernist work of literature, one of the earliest questions, one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself is whether this work of literature is uh, like has a lot of similarities with the traditional works of literature or whether this work of literature is actually criticizing previous modes of literature. So if you find the answer to this question, then of course finding the meaning of the work will be a little easier for you. But as I said, generally speaking, modernists hate the idea of giving you the meaning of the work like on a plate and saying, hey, dear reader, this is the meaning of my work. They hate that. As I said, they were not reading like for the ordinary people. They, they believed in, as we said, high modernism, believes in an elite readership, a kind of reader who has a lot of knowledge about world history, mythologies, religion, etc., and can connect all of the dots on his own. And so they believe that you as the reader have a very significant role in bringing the work to fruition in the meaning-making process. And, and, and that's why they say that, okay, well, creating a meaning is a human construct, so um, the meaning of the work cannot be uh, really separated from, uh, you know, trying to find the meaning of the work. So, in other words, they say that you have to be present as the reader, and then I have to be present as the writer of this work, so that together, we can create meaning because meaning cannot be created without the presence of human agents. So 
that's why search for meaning becomes a kind of um, motive and theme in, in, in the works of high modernism. And they prefer it to like didactic literature in which the writer says, hey, this is my message, listen to me, this is what I have to say. They actually give you the opportunity, modernists, give you the opportunity to search for the meaning if yourself. Another important quality of uh, modernist works is that they are self-reflexive. So in some parts of the, uh, of the novel or the work, they might draw your attention to the process of finding meaning. So uh, not only is the work about finding meaning, they also talk about different ways of finding meaning in the work itself. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but they are self-reflexive. They talk about themselves. They talk about their projects, okay, as if they are somebody else and who want to guide you in your search for meaning. So they are, uh, they want you to search for the meaning of the work, but they also talk about the process of finding meaning in literary works inside the novel. And so that makes it a kind of self-reflexive. Modernism influenced all of the important modes of literature that we know and cherish. So uh, poetry was influenced by modernism in this period. We have different kinds of movements in poetry, in particular imagism, um, which became uh, very, very popular. Uh, we have Ezra Pound. Uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, Hilda De Little. We have Amy Lowell. And Amy was Amy Lowell was so influential that sometimes they call imagism amagism. Uh, she was so influential in this movement. Novels were also uh, influenced by modernism. Uh, both of these poetry and, of course, novels tended to be shorter. Uh, short story as well. Short story, in fact, was highly influenced by the modernist movement. Of course, uh, short stories became lyrical in nature, so they kind of mimicked lyrical poetry. As you know, uh, when we talk about, <coughs> I'm sorry again for the constant coughing. Uh, when we talk about uh, lyrical poetry, what comes to mind is is that you know usually we are dealing with, um, as you know, a kind of uh, poetry which is a uh, brief. It has a single effect on the reader and it is very concise, right? And so the short stories of the period try to mimic lyrical poetry. In that, just like lyrical poetry, short stories focused on the individual. And so the, the narrator of the story is usually this kind of guy or, or a woman who is alone and lonely and introverted, who tries to portray his own world. world. He has a unique emotional perspective with regards to the events of the world. And he's full of contemplation. He contemplates all different parts of his experience as a person in this modern world, which usually leads to an emotional outburst. Now, you know, lyrical poetry um, is, is very old in the Western culture. We also have it, you know, if you go back to Greek mythology, you, you know that the lyre was, uh, the, the musical instru instrument, the lyre has mythological roots. Apollo heard Hermes, who was playing the lyre, and asked Zeus for the lyre, and so he, he became the god of music and singing, right? Uh, lyrical poetry is so flexible, it can be written in sonnets, in quatrains, and other forms of poetry, and it can talk about so many different things, love, mysticism, nature, nostalgia, the human condition, philosophical contemplations, etc. And we have it in all all parts of the Western history. We had it in the Renaissance, in the poetry of, for example, Petrarch. In Italy, or Thomas Wyatt and Shakespeare in England. We had it in the 17th century, in the poetry of Robert Herrick. We had it in the 18th century, even the Age of Enlightenment. Of course, it became less popular. We, we have it in the Romantic period, in the poetry of William Blake, William Wordsworth, uh, Percy B. Shelley, John Keats. In France, even, we have it in the poetry of Victor Hugo. In Germany, we have it in the poetry of Goethe. In Russia, we have it in the works of Pushkin. 
We even have it in the 20th century in the poetry of Yeats, Robert Frost, T.S. Eliot. So lyrical poetry was important in this age, and so short stories tended to become lyrical. So we have lyrical short stories. We have a lot of influential uh, critics who have talked about this, if you're interested. Eileen Baldeschweiler is one of those critics who talks about um, short stories in the modern age becoming uh, lyrical because of their subject matter in, in, and tone that, uh, you know, they usually try to describe, the, you know, they don't really care about, like these short stories, do not really care about external events, but how those events influence a character's feelings and emotions. And we also have like another uh, literary critic as well called Charles May, uh, who also uh, proposes that, you know, short stories became lyrical. And so what's common between all of these is that, you know, there is an interrelated structure. There are a lot of motives which are repeated. We have less attention to the external events. We have more focus on the emotional influence of those events in the minds of the characters. And so we are mostly interested, just like lyrical poetry, in portraying the feelings of the characters. And it's important for you to know that it is in the theory of Charles May that we have this idea of slice of life that I talked about, that literature is a slice of life. You don't have to explain everything. Um, you know, you just have to focus on the character, their minds, their feelings, their states of mind. And, uh, you know, you just have to portray a minimal sketch, so to speak a slice of life, and then the readers will fill in the gaps and then, of course, will find the meaning. So this is uh, kind of like what happens uh, in the realm of short story. Okay. Um, there's also a lot of attention in both poetry and fiction to a lot of, as I said, sensory image or detail. So what you feel at the moment, what you feel through your senses. And so we have sketches of contemporary life in these works. Uh, as I said, uh, one of the things that happened in this period was the idea that, okay, this is the definition of serious literature. Serious literature should be highbrow, so to speak, should be high modernist. It should be written for an elite group of readers. And so serious literature became uh, a, a dominant force in this age, but it was always struggling with the culture at large, the general, you know, culture of people, because the reading populations in the United States, for example, actually preferred different kinds of works. So they preferred tales of romance, adventure, historical novels, crime fiction, westerns. So the reading public really wanted that. And the problem was that most of these high modernists did not really have a huge readership. Most of them dreamed about finding, for example, millions of readers. And so, even if it happened, even when it, so most of them did not really find a huge readership because the literary, the, the audiences wanted some other kinds of works. And of course, these uh, literary modernists did not want to, um, you know, compromise their beliefs. So even when it happened for serious writers like Fitzgerald or Hemingway, other, you know, other members of high modernism accused themselves of selling themselves out. So they were saying that, hey, you, you sold out, you sold yourself out, you do not belong to us anymore, something like this. But anyway, uh, this was the opposition which was happening in this uh, age between, uh, you know, popular literature and, of course, serious high modernist literature. Magazines were still popular, just like the previous ages, although they could not really print a lot of serious literature because, well, people didn't like them, right? But they did publish from now and every now and then they published somebody important. So, for example, Vanity Fair published Gertrude Stein, E.E. E. Cummings, Sherwood Anderson, Edna Millay. So they published them, but really not as frequently as, uh, you know, the previous ages. Uh, the profession of authorship in the United States uh, is also important, an important topic that we should talk about because we talked about this in our previous videos that, you know, in, in America, uh, uh, 
writing was actually a way of talking about their nationalistic beliefs to create a kind of culture for the people of the society, to create a national literature, right? So authorship in the United States has always defined itself as a patriotic enterprise aimed at developing a cultural life for the nation so that they can embody national values. You know, high modernism uh, was one of the movements which happened in the United States. And of course, uh, some of these writers believed that America was not a suitable place anymore for a writer to live. And so some of them became permanent expatriates. They permanently left the United States and never came back. So Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, Hilda Doolittle, and T.S. Eliot were among the writers who left the United States and never came back because they believed that it's not a good place anymore for authors. There were also people who lived abroad, but for a brief period, and they finally came back, of course. Hemingway, Anderson, Fitzgerald, Claude McKay, Catherine Ann Porter, uh, Nella Larson, Robert Frost, Eugene O'Neill. These were, uh, these all decided to live uh, elsewhere for a short period of time, but then they ultimately came back. Now, what is common between all of them is that they believe that America as a country lacks high culture. You know, like people like popular culture, so there's really nothing for me here if I want to write serious literature. And so they believe that the, you know, America is kind of lax. America lacks this kind of high culture or they are indifferent to works of uh, serious literature. And that's why they believe that they have to move elsewhere where they are appreciated more. So they went to London in the first two decades of the 20th century, 1900s and 1910s. And of course, later on, they went to Paris during the 1920s, where they created a community for themselves. Um, uh, and so uh, these expatriates believed that they could survive in Europe, but not in the United States, because it was in Europe that they could find some kind of personal freedom. Now, uh, they also there is also something else which is common between these two groups of people, those who left permanently and those who went for a short period of time. They both believe that, you know, America needs to be in touch with the European culture more. So they believe that they were bringing the United States into contact with the European culture. Now, this kind of, um, you know, literary practice, uh, the fact that, for example, we have to uh, come into, you know, contact with the European culture, there should be like coexistence between the two was not something that everyone believed in. So we had some writers who believed that American literature needs to be international, but there were some people who were not really like this. And, and they said, that, okay, we are fine working in our national landscape. So I brought examples of how, you know, certain writers actually believed that, you know, just writing national literature is enough for them. So we have Hart Crane, we have Marion Moore, William Carlos Williams. They all try to write, you know, quote unquote, American works. We have John Dos Passos, who wrote a work called USA, who just, you know, tries to speak for a nation as a whole, tries to portray uh, a nation which is a unified whole. We have, you know, uh, some of Crane's poems like The Bridge or Williams's poems like uh, Patterson. Uh, in each one of these poems, one American city becomes a symbol for the whole nation, which is something that Walt Whitman also did. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald was ambitious uh, to be international, but he was content with writing, you know, just portraying the nation itself. E. E. Cummings, another important modernist poet, also uh, was content with just being American and being known as an American writer rather than an international writer. Claude McKay's America poem is also a very good example of this. And of course, William Faulkner, one of my favorite authors, you know, dedicated his whole life to the portrayal of the American South, and he was happy with it. So not all writers wanted to be international. Uh, and so among these people uh, that, you know, wanted to stay in America, wanted to write American literature, 
uh, we can name the regionalist writers that were also, you know, active in the previous age and also in this age. So regional writing continued to be practiced in this age. So we have writers like Sandberg, Edgar Lee Master, Sherwood Anderson, Willa Cather, who, you know, focused on the Midwest. And if you remember regional writing, we said that it's a kind of writing that believes that each part of the United States has unique features and they have to focus on that particular region. Uh, Willa Cather also talks about the Southwest. John Steinbeck, in his most famous works of Mice and Men, you know, Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, talks about California and moving to California as a land of opportunity. We have uh, Robinson and Robert Frost who, you know, talk about the new uh, talk about New England, but of course, the most prominent region in the United States about which numerous works have been written is, of course, the American South. So many prominent writers in the history of American literature have talked about the South. Well, of course, the most famous one of them is, of course, William Faulkner, but let's also not forget Zora Neale Hurston. Their eyes were watching God, the most probably famous novel of Hurston. Uh, other writers as well, Catherine Ann Porter talks about Texas in the South. Uh, we have Thomas Wolfe, who, uh, you know, talks about the Appalachian South. So all of these writers try to portray the South in their regional writings, sort of portray different aspects of the South. And these two writers in particular are important for us because they portray two different sides of this of the issue with the South. The problem with the South was, of course, slavery, right? White populations and black populations. So, for example, having a black writer and a white writer trying to portray life in the South is actually something very, very fascinating. So it shows, the pairing of those two actually shows the two sides of this argument about the history of race in the United States. And so, but of course, like generally speaking, uh, one thing that comes to mind is that, and, and you have to keep in mind, is that African American writers gained momentum and became more and more active in the literary scene of the United States. And it is actually the contribution of African American writers that kind of makes American modernism quite different from its European or international one, international version. Okay, so what uh, you know, makes it different, what makes American modernism different is actually the contributions, the contributions of African-American writers. We have previously talked about the Harlem Renaissance. We said that it was a city within a city in New York uh, with a population of 150,000 uh, like African-Americans, and they produced works for themselves, they composed poetry and music for themselves. And so a lot of these famous writers, Langston Hughes, County Collins, or Neil Hurston, they belong to the Harlem Renaissance, Claude McKay, Nella Larson, and their works were actually uh, defining works of American modernism. Uh, these writers either uh, showed anger in their works towards the systemic racism in the United States, or they showed some kind of hope for a social and racial uplift. But of course, the anger was more dominant. And nowhere, nowhere is this anger more prominent than, of course, in the native song by Richard Wright, the angriest uh, kind of work when it comes to the Harlem uh, Renaissance. Uh, we also have the uh, active participation of women in this period. Now, previously, and in the first video, I talked about the role, the significant role that American women played in, during the First and the Second World War. They became nurses, they became ambulance drivers, they joined the workforce when the country needed more workforce, and they ultimately also got what they had, they should have gotten even uh, long before 1920. They got their voting rights as well. So women were also important. It's <clears throat> interesting that a lot of male modernists were actually attacking female writers in this uh, age by identifying these writers as being didactic. And as you remember, we said that modernists hated didactic literature. So for them, 
a woman, a female writer was an, a symbol of didactic writing. And so they had to remove this female writer. But of course, women persevered and they associated with some of the most important um, side movements of modernism. And so they could not really be deleted from the history of American literature. Amy Lowell and H.D. Hilda Dolittle associated themselves with modernism, became important figures of imagism, a school of poetry, a movement in poetry. Marian Moore and Gertrude Stein became associated with high modernism, Willa Cather with regionalism, Zora Neale Hurston with the Harlem Renaissance, as well as Nella Larson here. And of course, we have Catherine Porter with psychological fiction, which was really loved in this period. Edna Millay with, you know, social and sexual liberation movements. And so women were really, really active. Some of them focused all of their energies on women's causes. Some of them focused on other causes like race, because they said that race is like a priority for them. And of course, we have like different people like um, Mina Loy is a very important figure. You know, uh, throughout my lecture, I've talked about a lot of Americans who left the United States permanently. I also talked about T.S. Eliot, who renounced his American citizenship and became a British citizen. But this uh, this was like vice versa. Min, uh, Mina Loy was a British uh, writer who emigrated to the United States and he, she actually wrote the Feminist Manifesto in which, uh, you know, she tried to, you know, bring two concepts to reconciliation. And she said that like being a mother being uh, or motherhood in general does not really have to be a, a restriction for women or a constraint on the freedoms of women. And so in that manifesto, she tried to, you know, talk about the idea that like being a mother, a woman can be a mother and then can express herself freely at the same time. And finally, we want to talk about, you know, the idea of drama in the United States. Now, previously, we have never talked about this because uh, drama in America did not really turn into a self-conscious literary form until 1920, which is when Eugene O'Neill published Beyond the Horizon. What I said does not really mean that there was no theater in the United States. This is quite wrong. Theater had always been a part of the, you know, social life in America. Uh, a lot of like centers uh, were built in Boston, in Philadelphia, as well as New York City, but it really didn't become a dominant literary form in the United States until the 1920. Uh, you know, uh, American uh, playwrights uh, had found some perfect models by 1915, and that's why, for example, later on, New York suddenly became this center for theater, especially that area of New York, which is known as Broadway. So by 1915, American playwrights who were kind of timid and were kind of like afraid of writing drama found some great models in Europe. So for them, Henry Gibson in Europe, George Bernard Shaw in England showed that, you know, drama can also be used to talk about serious issues and ideas. We also have the, you know, psychological dramas of August Strindberg. We have the works of Maurice Maeterlinck. We have you know, the sophisticated dramas of uh, uh, Arthur Schnitzler. And so these all provided perfect models for American writers. And so just like all kinds of other realms, as I said, uh, poetry was uh, experiencing some change, fiction was experiencing some ch change. So was drama, thanks to Eugene O'Neill, who tried to refine American drama. And so we have so many different kinds of playwrights in this period who suddenly, you know, found the courage to express themselves through the medium of drama. We have Sidney Howard, we have Lillian Hellman, we have Robert uh, Sherwood, who became um, practitioners of realistic plays. We have George Kaufman and we have Moss Hart, who invented a kind of, you know, a, a very American kind of uh, drama, you know, uh, in which... We have a social comedy by, you know, cracking jokes about domestic and social issues. But of course, we have other ones as well. So this one was Wisecracking, which was, you know, like a, a sitcom, uh, you know, cracking even sometimes like ludicrous jokes, uh, but about social issues. But if you want uh, higher forms of comedy, 
a comedy of ideas, so to speak. You can, of course, look for Berman and, of course, Philip Barry. Another important American, uh, distinctively American invention was, of course, musical comedy. And so uh, this also found its uh, way into the American drama in the works of George and Ira Gershwin in the 1920s and 1930s. We have Oscar, uh, Oscar Hammerstein, uh, of course, with Jerome Kern and Richard Rogers, who performed musical comedies from 1920s until 1950s. And so social com commentary and satire are the defining features of American drama and became an integral part of it. Like from the 1920s, it began and then it continues, 1930s and 40s and, of course, later on, 50s. So social criticism, as we said, was really, really important. You can find like numerous examples in which uh, we, we have, like, like in this perfect example, Clifford the Dead's waiting for Lefty. We have just a group of like taxi drivers who go on a strike to protest something and then this strike turns into like a, a debate forum in which people express their ideas and they do some kind of social commentary and uh, criticize the society, of course. There are two important developments which happen in this period which kind of help the development of uh, American drama. First is the Federal Theater Project of 1935 to 1939 established by President Roosevelt to provide employment to theater artists, which was good news for all of them. And so we also have the Negro Theater Unit, a major creative form of uh, a project which, you know, tried to produce works of drama by using uh, all black cast, right? And so when they performed The Boys is Haiti, all of the people involved in the production of this play were, you know, African Americans. Even th there was an all-black version of Shakespeare's Macbeth, which was uh, kind of uh, adapted by Orson Welles in 1936. So these two important events happened, which helped American drama. And finally, we come to the rise of Hollywood and moves, movies and motion pictures. You know, the rise of the film industry encouraged many playwrights to move to California, to move to Hollywood, in order to find new outlets for their works. So for example, Robert Sherwood became a screenwriter. Even, even like William Faulkner wrote a few screenplays, and of course, Fitzgerald as well. But of course, these two writers are examples of uh, failures because Hollywood for them was a graveyard of serious literature because they couldn't really produce uh, uh, screenplays uh, which was, you know, which were as good as their serious literature. But of course, some people became successful, like Sidney Howard won an Oscar in 1940 for his, you know, adaptation of Gone with the Wind. Uh, Catherine Ann Porter found recognition and fame and even money in Hollywood. But of course, there are examples of writers who failed miserably in Hollywood. And, and this brings, of course, our analysis of, you know, the period 1914 to 1945 to a completion. Of course, it goes without saying that uh, these uh, brief lectures cannot really cover all of the complexities and idiosyncrasies of uh, diverse writers that we have in the period, nor can I claim to have covered all of the major events of this period. So what I did was, you know, try to teach you some of the most important things that happened in this period and some of the most important trends in the literature of the period. And I really hope uh, that you have enjoyed watching this video so far. So thank you very much for watching uh, this second video. And um, thank you very much and bye-bye.